Okay. Welcome everyone to today's eSport Research Colloquium. We will listen to a presentation by Guillermo Mendoza, who will be talking about the definition of eSports and its implications for psychophysiological research. Without further ado, I will um, hand over to Guillermo, who will also introduce himself, um, will present his research and his ideas today. And in the end, we will have the opportunity to have an open discussion where you can forward your questions to Guillermo or to me. I hope everyone will enjoy today's presentation and the stage is yours. Thank you, Oli. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you for joining. I know this is uh, quite a odd uh, time for you to have this kind of meeting. But uh, take in mind that uh, I'm not in Europe. I'm currently residing in Bolivia, South America. So the time zone is uh, quite different. Also, uh, I've been uh, living the past years in Spain. Now I have in, uh, because of the COVID situation, I'm having my actual residence in my uh, hometown. Okay, so today we're going to talk, I want to start uh, talking and sharing some, some thoughts and concerns and ideas that I have about uh, the definition of sports and implication of psychophysiological research because this is the kind of research that I'm focusing for my uh, doctoral thesis. It's not because there's like a more important topic or not. This is just the, the ones that I'm like uh, focusing on. Uh, uh, today, I want to talk about first a little bit of context of wh who I am and why, why I'm here. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, the title, what's going on with definitions in esports and how it's affecting methodology in some papers from my point of view, how it's uh, affecting or how it's uh, uh, modifying, you can say. Uh, of course, I want to share my personal research. That's this is the, the you know, the current um, uh, way that uh, you're doing in this kind of meeting. So I want to share what I'm uh, studying, what I'm publishing or looking for publish. And at the end, uh, have some space for a little bit of uh, discussions, opinion, questions, etc. So giving a little bit of context, who I am, I'm like you know already, Guillermo Mendoza is my name. I'm sports psychology for Vodafone Giants and Existence. Uh, both of uh, uh, teams are uh, Spain teams, um, very known in, in that country with a little bit of history uh, competing, especially in their main games, that is League of Legends and uh, CSGO. Uh, also, I have a master's in sports psychology, master's in research in sports science. And like I said, right now I'm doing my PhD uh, thesis, my doctoral thesis by the University of Malaga. So there is, that's why it's, I'm interested in, in uh, researching, focusing right now, my thesis with uh, focusing on uh, psychophysiological responses, specifically uh, speaking, uh, hormonal responses on, uh, on eSports players. I want to do a little bit of a disclaimer as well. I'm a novice researcher uh, and I made my own mistakes in this way. I'm not here to present myself as an expert in, in any topic. I'm just like uh, starting to, to publish. Uh, so it's uh, uh, my idea it's, or my goal is not to bring to you the definitive definition of esports. Like uh, I'm not like uh, uh, aiming to do that, not today or not in my research. Uh, but uh, I want to share also my concerns, uh, perhaps provide some insights for future research, because uh, the things that I like the most about these meetings is that everyone here is a researcher. 
and if we get some uh, ideas or if we get some um, uh, some perhaps insights that to apply for our future research, it, it will be at the end of the day uh, the the body of knowledge that we have uh, on esports will be uh, you know a stronger one. So basically, this is my goal for today to have an open discussion about a uh, definition. I know this could be like a little bit of a, a controversial topic perhaps, like, uh, uh, but let's see what your opinion is about and, and we will talk at the end of my presentation. Okay, so first of all, uh, like you perhaps already know, esports is a popular uh, keyword to uh, to research. It's a hot topic. Uh, this is a graph that uh, shows how many papers through the years have esports as a keyword. Uh, by uh, missing uh, current year, I'm pretty sure that uh, 2021 will blow up this chart because so far it's going to like a lot of, of, of papers is being publishing. In other words, a lot of people uh, are interested in researching uh, about esports. So by having this increase in, in studies, increase in research, I also find a little bit of concern from my side uh, because like I said I'm a novice researcher and trying to look from some um, uh, references for my for my current studies and I found myself a little bit of confused because some of uh, especially uh, specifically speaking on studies that have been focusing on hormonal responses uh, there's been, I'm going to address that uh, later, but it's going to, uh, I found that it's, uh, it's so far, it's been, uh, re results has been mixed. So it's, uh, I start to notice as well that one of the things that perhaps influence those mixed results are not only a methodology, uh, methodological, I don't know if I'm, I'm saying it right, but also uh, theoretical. In other words, the kind of definitions that different studies are using and how is that is affecting. So I'm starting to, um, going to put uh, some, some examples about uh, this. Uh, uh, take in mind that um, my, my purpose of uh, uh, talking, it's, um, uh, it's just to, to, like I said, not to bring the, the definitive uh, uh, definitions, but uh, to, to share some, to, or to find some uh, key points. So for example, uh, I choose these three just because are the ones that I know the most. Uh, the first one on my, in my life is perhaps the, the one that is uh, cited and quoted uh, mo more. It's the Hamari ones. Perhaps you already, uh, of course, you already know that one that uh, defines esports as a form of sports when the primary aspect of the sports are facilitated by electronic systems. The input of players and team has, uh, as well as the output of the esports systems, are mediated by human computer interfaces. If I recall correctly, uh, this paper has around uh, 160 times been quoted and, and cited. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite influential, uh, this, uh, this definition in last, uh, in last uh, research. And if you notice, it's also quite open. You know, it's, uh, it could be, um, uh, again, debatable if we can like uh, trim it or you know, make it more specific. Another one that is like uh, very cited is the Jenny uh, 2017. And it's uh, short and, and simple. It's an organized video game competition. 
and this is a uh, uh, is resulting those two two uh, specific factors that I'm finding or at least I'm agree with uh, most of the definitions uh, that I'm going to address in a little bit. And uh, uh, at your right, you're going to see the um, the Pedraza definition. I guess like you know, uh, Ismail. This is a, a longer, perhaps more descriptive kind of definition. But uh, I also, I, I wanted to include it because I think that is more complete, it's more all around. Also, I understand that it's harder to quote it because it's longer, but I think that it's, uh, um, it's more, more, more complete. Uh, why I think that? Uh, because it uh, contains three factors that I think most of, Esports definition have, but not not all have the the three of uh, these factors. The first one that are the most that uh, most definition have is the competitive factor. Like more authors agree that esports is competitive gaming or video game competitions, uh, or in some or in some way uh, has a factor of. Uh, uh, two people like facing each other in in a competitive in a competitive setting. The second factor that is not quite uh, you don't see it quite often, but you all you start to see it, is the factor of organization, in the way that uh, it's not just about competition, it's about that that competition, it's also uh, regulated by an institution that say, okay, you're not just com uh, competing against each other, but uh, that uh, institution say how you should compete and dictate how different um, tournament should, uh, should organize or should, should be with what kind of rules. So in other ways, uh, if, you, if you already may know, uh video games have their their you know the ladder rules and other video games have in the same video game i mean uh, they have their tournament rules so they have different rules to 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 play the same video game so you can in in that way you can art that of course video games is playing video games is not the same that playing esports even if you're playing the same video game because inside that video game, you can find tournament rules to play uh, like official games, official esports games. So uh, this is the second factor that I find that it's, uh, it's good to consider uh, in a definition. And the third one that is the, the less common, but I think that it also helps to, to trim and to define a little better is a factor of skill that that video game should be a skill uh, kind of a uh, game it, if it's completely random or 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 is by chance like for example roulette or any or any other betting uh, electronic game uh, it, it shouldn't be called an esports that's why i think that it's uh, it's important to include it and of course, is if it is a, is it has a factor of skill, you can train it and you can develop it. So that's why I think that even though it's not the, the most common one, I think it helps to define a little bit more uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of you know video game who, who we could uh, call uh, an esports and other ones we could not. In these topics, still, I know could be a little bit of, you know, um, discussion because uh, how or where do we include uh, those pay to win games? So it's, uh, it's a little bit of debatable, uh, the third factor, but I know that at least the first two, uh, most of uh, current uh, definitions are including this, uh, these two factors. So, 
um, like again, I'm saying that's just not only these three. I'm just sharing like the three like I'm finding the more uh, more commons or finding like in the third example the you know the more complete one. Uh, in the next slide, like I was saying, I'm going to share some examples of how uh, definition it's uh, also influencing the methodology on how uh, using then different kind of definitions will affect or will change perhaps the methodology in, um, uh, how can I say, in, in the paper, in the study. So uh, be aware that even though perhaps I'm a little bit of criticizing some of those following papers, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not focusing on, or I'm not saying that they're not a good quality kind of research. I think of, because I'm including including in my in my own papers, I think they are relevant or they are in some way in some way important. But I think like there are good examples of how different definitions will influence or can influence the methodology. Uh, I have uh, three papers here. Uh, not because they are the, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, I'm just like uh, uh, remembering more this, uh, this kind of examples. For example, for example, on your left, I have uh, the Tartar one, a prospective study evaluating the effect of nutritional supplement intervention and cognition, mood states and mental performance in video gamers. Even though the title doesn't contain the esports as a title, uh, in the abstracts and in the keywords, they include the word esports, and they define esports uh, even though they don't provide like a a, a, um, a, a definitions like uh, very explicit. They they put in their introductions uh, the the closest as a, as a definition is the one that is resulted esports or video game playing. So. They're taking the definition very wide, very wide. So it's if for for these papers playing video games, it's kind of the same of playing esports. So how can I affect this definition on their methodology? Is that uh, they're including criteria? It's also wider. For example, uh, they including uh, people uh, who played. Uh, five or more hours per week on the last uh, six months prior on the screening. So they're not including any kind of uh, competitive context or they're not uh, you know, including any kind of uh, esports related kind of uh, context or, or, or what I understand as esports. So again, they're not incoherent, they're following their own definition but uh, I'm putting an example of how uh, uh, different definitions can influence uh, their methodology. The second example, it's a, a social silence and three uh, predict performance and cardiovascular responses during competitive video gaming. This one, for example, it also doesn't include esports in their title, but they, it's included in their, in their abstract and introduction. And it's defined by esports is a form of competition that use video games. So this again, this is a a, a, a step for a step further, you know, uh, in the you know in I don't know in the ladder because it's uh, it's defined a little bit uh, a little bit better, but also has uh, uh, some room some room left, you know, to 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 play with. So how it's affected the the methodology, for example, in the context, in the competitive context, they are including a, a computed, uh, you know, a competition between participants uh, in during a computer uh, control avatars. Again, uh, in other words, they are playing against bots. So it is uh, it is a video game competitions, like they're saying, and they're following their definition. But like again, it's because they're using a different definition. I mean. If they were using a different definitions, that will, I guess, affect in their methodology as well. So this is another example of how it's important, like for future research, to 
to get together as a researcher, uh, researchers and use uh, some, some common one. And the third example that I'm putting, it's a physiological and cognitive functions following a discrete session of competitive gaming. This is again, uh, they're not, uh, oh, this is what the one that they're using eSports in their title. And of course, in their introductions, they are defining eSports as an organized electronic and video game competition. And this is the one that I, I find more, more, more interesting because they're putting organized electronic and video game competitions. And in their methodology, uh, I think that I'm very, I've been very picky with this one because uh, for example, they're using, uh, they're saying that the data were only collected from tournament settings, including comp competition ag against another schools for a prize and or, or uh, using ranked settings uh, online against strangers to gain or lose ranking. So in other words, they using data from competitive games against other schools and they're using the same data in the same database for ranked games. Uh, so their, their, uh, uh, their explanation is that the ranked games are uh, online, utilize the same formats and rules uh, uh, as in competition against other schools. I'm not pretty sure that because they're not saying that competition against other schools are using official tournament rules, but my guess is that it is, but they're not saying that. That's why I'm saying that I'm kind of like being very, very picky with this one. Uh, but uh, any, anyone that perhaps you, uh, you have been working with is for players, uh, you can know or you can guess that ranked, uh, playing rankets are not exactly the same as playing tournament games, specifically not just by the rules, but psychologically speaking. Uh, uh, it's um, for competitive players, uh, ranked games are using more for training or for creating content. Uh, so uh, putting together in the same, in the same analysis, uh, official games against other teams and ranked games could be also sports as competitive games and training games. No, so it's it's quite a, like a, a very uh, a very a delicate uh, topic because so far I haven't found a, a, a specific paper that address this specific uh, issue. Perhaps this is an idea for future research. But uh, my guess is that you will find, if you compare that, you will find a different kind of activation, different kind of anxiety, different kind of worries, different kind of motivation by playing against uh, humans, against other organized teams that you know, against playing ranked with you know, people you, you don't know. Uh, so my question is, uh, even though this could be uh, very valid and well well done uh, research. Are we talking about esport research or we're we talking about video game research? This is a very uh, delicate line to 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 see. And how how can affect this? I mean, why we why I find or why I consider that we as a researchers uh, have a common uh, ground to to use a sport definition for future research specifically. You will see when uh, you read uh, a review. If someone uh, has done a review, of course, they're like looking for keywords, and uh, uh, many of, of uh, different kind of papers will appear. And like we will address and we talk later, uh, you will find very mixed results. So uh, I think this is this part is very influential. Of that why we are finding very mixed results so far in esports research. I think that this is improving. We are moving uh, in the right direction as a, as a body of knowledge. But so far, I think like uh, we, we can like uh, improve even, even better.
Uh, so what about phys uh, psychophysiological uh, research? Uh, first, I want to explain a little bit for the ones that are not too familiar from some theories about psychophysiological research in general, not just in esports. One of the more, if not the more uh, theoretical, um, uh, I can say to, I like theoretical body uh, that is used is the uh, by social status hypothesis by Masur. Uh, I'm sorry that this slice is in, in Spanish. I blandly uh, still in a slide from my thesis director, <laughs> but I think it's very well done. So uh, I, I just put it uh, here. Basically what it says, uh, this, uh, this theoretical model is that uh, people as a social uh, beings, they are motivated by status, by social status. So any situation that can bring, uh, that can make them a, a, a scale in the social ladder uh, will be very motivated and activated, even like physiological speaking. And every scenario or situation that can make them lose that status, of course, will affect as well. So because we are not like primates and fighting for being alpha males all the time, the more uh, the contest that it brings this kind of situation more are sports. So winning and losing, it's affecting our, not just our minds, but you know, our physiological responses, specifically speaking, our hormonal responses. Uh, Many papers, many studies have find that, uh, found that uh, winning is affecting your testosterone by increasing your testosterone levels. And it could be uh, increasing or decreasing your cortisol levels. Uh, as you may know that testosterone is related to aggression, it's related to risk-taking, it's related to, related to uh, power feelings and a little bit of confidence as well. And cortisol is a stress hormone. So it's uh, winning, it can be this, it can have this effect most of the time. And uh, losing, it's affecting your testosterone by decreasing, like making you feeling less powerful, let's say, and high in your testosterone by increasing your stress levels. So basically, after you win or lose, you will get affected if you have to play in a short period of time for the next uh, for the next game. So if you win, you will you will bring to the next game a higher testosterone and perhaps a lower level of cortisol. That is called the winner effect. So the more you win, the more testosterone, the more confidence, the more you know uh, power feelings you will you will get. And it will, it will be a little bit more probable that you will win the next game. That's why it's called the, the winner effect. More or less, this is the, the biosocial uh, status hypothesis. So how is being done in traditional esports? For example, I have here uh, two examples from uh, regular traditional sports. The first one on the uh, uh, higher side of your screen, it's, uh, it's made by Aguilar and it's uh, in hockey. It's a longitudinal uh, study that is showing uh, the difference uh, between uh, cortisol and testosterone uh, in, in different, different games. So if we say, if we, uh, Analyzing this, we can say that on first game uh, they won and they have uh, significantly increased their testosterone. The second game as well, they won and they they show between before and after an increase in, in testosterone. And in the third game, if I remember correctly, it was like an important game, a semifinal or final. They lost, so they they present a, a decreasing in testosterone levels. 
And by call to solve, it's uh, if they want, it doesn't have any difference. Some of them, some of the players increase, other ones decrease their level. So it was not a significant difference. Uh, the second victory as well, the same. And the third one that they lost, they present like a very uh, uh, increase of cortisol. So that theory applies, for example, in this, uh, in this kind of study. Another study used in, uh, in, in football uh, also show kind of uh, the same, but comparing in different uh, uh, importance or different kind of uh, competition, different kind of games. Uh, for example, in during before and after the, the befores are the dark ones, the after and there are the white ones. So uh, it, it, they use uh, three different groups, uh, amateurs, um, competitive, but not professionals and professionals. So basically what they found is uh, training games. They're not affecting too much any they're not finding any difference in testosterone uh, friendly games more or less the same they're like uh, finding in the amateur level like uh, a bigger difference but in the same way that training games they're not very influential uh, but uh, on competition competitive official games they indeed they find a uh, very difference uh, in in uh, testosterone responses. So in the three groups, uh, both uh, uh, amateur and and competitive ones uh, are uh, very different, and the professional ones they were not as different, but it still was a significant significant difference between the before and after levels of testosterone. So there you go. It's uh, uh, it's quite uh, it's, it's, it's quite um, showing the uh, this kind of theory. So in traditional esports, they find it they find it that they they're getting it's more or less coherence from the main theory. What is going on with esports? Like uh, I said at the beginning we're finding a mixed results. I'm putting here a, a, a systematic review, just focusing on stress by our host, Oliver. Uh, so perhaps he will clarify a little bit if I made a mistake, please. Uh, but basically uh, what is saying that in cortisol, there are mixed results. Some of the, some of the papers are finding that, uh, uh, finding difference between playing esports uh, and other, other paper, it's a, a finding no difference, no increase in cortisol levels from baselines comparing to post a uh, game uh, and, and, uh, and testosterone, the one that it was considered, they find no, diff no significant difference on testosterone levels uh, while playing uh, uh, and League of Legends. So basically, the the theory that or the kind of graphic that we are finding in traditional esports, so far, I'm I mean I'm I'm telling you my experience. So far, it was not uh, we were not finding the same kind of results in esports. So actually, this paper, uh, I have to be honest, it's helped me a lot because it's. Uh, it's clarified, being clarifying for me. That's more or less my my point of view. That uh, one of the factors that are uh, it's influencing the mixed results are the the difference also uh, in not just methodological speaking but also theoretical. They're using different kind of definition of esports, and of course they will affect their methodology, how their uh, method it's it's planned for doing that that study. So basically uh, what it's concluding in this paper is that uh, studies need to in investigate actual esports competition because some of them are using some uh, lab setting 
other ones they're using just uh, friendly kind of games uh, with uh, you know artificial how can I say artificial motivation like uh, giving some prize money or some uh, you know different kind of uh, incentive and of course one of the things that I've been uh, struggling as well like uh, the many of the papers is um, uh, where is the sample size. Uh, it's quite difficult to find some relevant uh, sample, you know, actual, uh, not just video gamers, but esport players that have or meet the inclusion criteria that it should meet in order for us to call it an actual and esport research or in, uh, an esport paper. So I want to share my my own uh, my own research. Uh, what about me? What I'm trying to do, at least, because the first one is not published yet, but I'm hoping to publish uh, very soon. Well, we did. It's a longitudinal pilot study from a professional uh, team that I've been working with. Uh, these uh, samples, testosterone uh, levels were uh, taken during uh, um, the L LVP leak. It's like the first division in Spain. So what we did is to take samples uh, during a rest day, again, like playing ranked uh, games, you know, uh, resting, playing like a non, it's not, it was not a training, it was a rest day. They were like playing uh, uh, whatever they want. So uh, uh, we take the samples during a rest day and we didn't find any uh, uh, significant difference in uh, the before and after in testosterone. It was not a significant uh, difference bef between these two. Then we measured an official game um, uh, during like a regular season game, I mean, and we we did find uh, an, uh, a significant difference. Uh, they, of course, won. That's why they increase the testosterone levels significantly. If you can see, it was, uh, if I remember, the last game of the season. So they managed to qualify for playoffs. So they bring even higher levels of testosterone for the next game. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, this is semifinal. So I, I, we, we couldn't measure quarterfinals, but they also won. So for semifinals, their initial pre-game levels of testosterone were even higher than their post-game, post-regular season uh, levels. And they won, so they increased their testosterone significantly as well, if you can see. Uh, if we even we can compare uh, the the levels of testosterone uh, between regular sports, and we can find even similar levels than the professional groups. It's uh, in these cases because it's a small sample; it's just one team. This this uh, this study is it's uh, it has like a, a much bigger sample, but if we can see uh, there testosterone levels are similar from uh, professional athletes. So uh, we find like a, a for next game in some players, even higher uh, levels of testosterone uh, for the, the befores. And you can, guess, you can guess how the final went for us. So we lost the game and uh, the level of testosterone, uh, they they decrease significantly as well. So even though the previous, uh, the previous research find that there's not this significant difference in testosterone, perhaps it was not just because they were playing video games, it was because the setting or the methodology they were using perhaps not a real competitive uh, setting, but it, again, this is we have to. Um, I want to be cautious with these results because it's just a pilot study. It's a very small sample, 
but it's encouraging because I found that actually the it's more similar when we use actual competitive or professional players in a competitive setting. The results, the graphics, it's more similar to traditional sports when we use those uh, both uh, factors. So it's actually, uh, even though it, 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 it sucks that we lost a final, uh, for like I always say it for science, it was a good a good uh, things to happen because in this uh, way we could see uh, how the testosterone responses were in a different uh, if with a different results because so far we only been uh, measuring when they were winning. So by this one, it was actually very similar than the hockey one if you remember. They, they won, they increased, they won, they increased, they lost, they decreased their testosterone. So it's quite similar. Uh, and again, it's similar in the, in, the other, uh, in the other paper because training and friendly games, they were not relevant. They were not uh, increasing any testosterone for the players. So in our own as well, like if they were not actually playing uh, official games, uh, it's kind of like they didn't care, right? So uh, again, this is not uh, this is uh, yet to be published, but it's uh, like I said, it's quite of encouraging that we uh, uh, we got a similar results than traditional sports. Another study that we did that this one is, is, is published is a comparative study between a control group and I mean control group, I mean that they were completely novice. They were even like they, they didn't consider themselves uh, video gamers. They were just uh, learning that day um, playing League of Legends. This one is on League of Legends as well. And experts, uh, it was a group of uh, people that were complete, competing uh, official uh, tournaments. And, and, and we take the samples on an official tournament. And it was, uh, it was an amateur uh, league, but it will follow all the, all the rules. I mean, it was a, uh, also a presential uh, competition. It was not online. So both of uh, both of the measures were uh, using even the same room, the same computers. So it was kind of like the same setting, and the main variables were the the, the groups, the samples. So in this case, we measure a uh, cortisol, not a testosterone. So we find that uh, uh, even though the the post competition levels were not significantly because was uh, the control group was very variable. Like we, we saw on the graph that winning or losing can alter in different ways. Like winning could like higher your cortisol or even lower. It depends of, uh, it's not very clear yet. So that's why we had uh, um, uh, very different in our control group. Still our expert group percent higher level of cortisols, uh, but in the pre-competitive uh, measurement, we find that uh, the experts indeed uh, present a higher level of, uh, of cortisols. We also measure some uh, subjective, uh, um, subjective variables. We ask them how important they consider the next match and of course, the expert ones uh, consider consider it their next match way more important than the control ones. The control ones were participating again in in a, technically a friendly match, but it was uh, they were like playing for a prize. But still, it was not as important. It was not as stressful like uh, the competitive uh, the competitive groups that they were uh, playing officials. So again, this is very similar to traditional sports that uh, we find that uh, when we're using competitive players and we're using, uh, we're measuring in a competitive settings, 
our results were more similar uh, uh, with uh, transitional sports. Again, I, I, I want to be cautious because it's still like uh, in Oliver's papers, uh, one of the limitation of my studies is that the sample is quite small. We in this in this case we have uh, 20, 20, 25, 25 competitive players, uh, so it's not it's not that uh, that high of a sample, and they were like competitive but amateurs in this uh, case. They were not uh, professional players. So uh, my uh, my discussion or my my points. Uh, basically are that uh, future research should take in consideration uh, if they are using in their methodology, official games, ranked games, uh, friendly games, or even lab settings. Uh, it's not that they shouldn't use ranked or friendly, but I think they should report that they're using these kind of games in order to take in consideration because of course, uh, if we if we only measure during official games, we have less control over our sample. Or we are we are also have less control over over other variable, variables that could happen during our measurements. So that's why I think it's important as well to do research in different settings. But I think it's important to uh, report this difference as well and. Uh, and taking consideration that uh, it, it will lead perhaps to different results. Another point that I think it's, uh, I think this, this is the one that uh, uh, researchers are like improving faster, I, I know how to say it, but to take expertise levels in consideration that novice players are getting different results from experience or semi-professionals or even professional levels so far, many studies are finding that their uh, psychological or physiological responses are quite different. So even though we technically like two papers were addressing the same variables uh, in the same esports, uh, perhaps they could find different results because they were using different expertise levels. So uh, even though it was not, uh, even though it's not a comparative uh, paper, uh, I think they should also report uh, what kind of levels or include their uh, or uh, report their inclusion criteria to to put uh, to consider for the reader if uh, if if they they're going to use or they're going to to uh, to you know to use in 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 your own papers this uh, these results. And this is just a you know uh, a personal uh, thought that I have. So far, I think that also moments it's important for specifically for physiological research. So far, uh, uh, I've been not only in my research but in different papers. It, we start to finding that it's not the same measuring players before they have a game, after they have a game. It's not the same measuring if they win that game, if, if they lost that game. So uh, reporting the moment, the, the competitive moment or when this data was taken, I think it's also important to take in consideration for physiological research. Uh, because again, like we can get the same same method if we change this variable and take in different uh, in different competitive moments we could have uh, different uh, results as well so i think it's important for physiological research to report uh, in what competitive moment uh, was taken was a rest day it was a uh, off season it was during you know playoff I think it's it's also important to to take in consideration. Uh, I don't know how how we have uh, in time, but uh, for me this is my presentation. Thank you a lot for your attention, 
And thank you for your questions. I haven't read it yet, but have a great day. You have my contact information there. If you want to, you contact me later. Uh, I don't know if you, I, um, uh, you can, Oli, you can help me with the questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked your critical perspective on the definition, and I also like the insights on your two studies. The one I already cited in a paper I submitted recently. And yes, be one, before one be, before I want forward my questions to you, I want to give the audience the opportunity to ask their questions. So, are there any questions for Guillermo? So please go ahead and type them in the chat or unmute your microphone. I um, could perhaps kick off just a, a basic one and excuse me if I, I've missed this, but um, thanks for your presentation, Guillermo. Uh, I guess my question Thank is, you. do you, maybe, maybe I didn't get this, but as a result of your work in the psychophysiology of, yes. of esports, um, mm -hmm. Do you think that definitions should change to reflect these psychophysiological variables, or it, 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 what is what is the maybe I'm missing the bridge here between the definitions and and the need for um, more sort of detail in the demographics? Uh, I, I, let me see if I understand your question correctly. Uh, uh, you're asking me if uh, in psychophysiological research, I consider that uh, we need to, to, to put an exact definition for future research, is, is, is that it? Or? It's, it's more, uh, I sense you're, you're, you don't think any of the current definitions that we might use in, for what esports is are up to standard, up to spec, and Oh, okay. would, you then, would you then change them to include an element of psychophysiology? Is that is that what you're? Oh, oh no, it's a uh, uh, th thank you. Uh, now I get it. No, it's actually I I think like so far uh, I mean lately most of the esport definitions that we use it's uh, taking in consideration important factors. Uh, like I said, the competitive uh, setting is is a key one that I guess like more um, more and more authors are you know have that in common. Uh, the second factor is the organizational one that is going to is being appearing in some definitions. Uh, like I said, my goal it was not uh, to I'm no I was not aiming to put like a, like I said like a definitive definition. You know the ultimate definition of esports. I think that could improve uh, with time. But at least in my in my perspective, those three factors should be taken in mind. Uh, I mean, my at the end of the day, my my goal was not to define or to to get to the definition, but to get to for me more important is the methodology. So even though like, but my point is that how the definition you use, it's affecting your methodology. Because if you if you are using a more wider definition, your methodology also or your sample, you know, or your setting could be also taking like more white uh, kind of sample. So th this is kind of my my point that uh, helping to narrow it the definition will also help to narrow in the the or the put more common methodologies for future research because so far we find it very mixed results because of these two factors you know different uh, uh, definitions are included and also different methodologies are included so so more for, i mean uh, like putting in one sentence for me more important that getting you know uh, you know uh, getting together for coming up from a, a, a one definition it's to in methodology. I think methodology is more important for me. That at least our methodology could include these these three factors. You know, a competitive setting, uh, like it's this kind of setting could be like in organizational. You know, following specific rules, and it should include uh, you know a, some sort of skill. So that's why I was my my point 
was that uh, definition is affecting methodology. And I think like methodology, it's like getting together to, to find like a, even like common grounds for use in methodology for our future research is more important to finding, you know, a definitive definition for each purpose. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Matthew. Um, and now Isma. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Guillermo. Yes. yes. Hi, Isma. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to have your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting to see your results. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, nice that you are talking about the methodology right now. I think it's an important aspect that we need to consider to really have some quality in ESPOS research uh, for the future research that is coming. So I wanted to ask you more in the direction towards how, I mean, you have done a study that has been very or highly ecologically, uh, it would put in terms of the, the design of the research. So how would you manage uh, to control those variables um, that could provide high noises or high artifacts to, 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 do, to your variables. So how would you manage to, to control this in such dynamic environments and like those competitive situations? So how, how have you been coming up with, with this idea of controlling some variables? Uh, thank you. It's my great question, actually. Uh, sometimes I guess, or at least from my knowledge, you can't. Uh, that's one of the limitation of doing such a design that you get a closer as the real situation, but you have less control that in lab in lab settings, you know. So uh, from my discussion or my conclusions, uh, like uh, you remember, I was not saying that you shouldn't use uh, lab settings. Uh, I think that's a uh, lab uh, settings uh, uh, studies can bring a lot of insights, a lot of knowledge. Uh, but uh, I was just saying that it's important to report that our, our intake in, you know, in reviews or future research to take in consideration and, and not, don't mix it up. Because sometimes uh, during, in, of course, competitive uh, settings, uh, you don't have control over even crowds, even uh, coaches, even like any other factors that can influence the physiological responses. So uh, of course, it's, uh, you, some of them you can you don't control. From, from what we did, uh, we tried to at least uh, have the, all the variables that we could control, for example, to make them play in the same room with the same computers in the same kind of like uh, scenario, try to give them uh, or to make them play uh, in, in the same, you know, tournament rules, even though they were having a clue that what they're doing by band and peaks, they were like doing like randomly, at least they're following the same rules uh, that, the, you know, the competitive ones were doing. But of course, like uh, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot control everything. That's why I think like uh, all kind of research can bring useful information. But I think like, because we are starting to researching, some of these different methodologies are mixing up. So that's why I think it's better to separate or to report it. That's why I think it's important for many papers so far that is are not using uh, an actual competitive setting is reporting or they're starting to include, in, they're including and reporting their uh, inclusion criteria for their samples. I think that is very important. So uh, any, any uh, studies can be, uh, insightful in their specific way, but I think it's 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 important to start to consider uh, this and uh, like um, I could like um, uh, in my top of my in the top of my head to remember a couple of papers that they're just reporting they were for example is for players and but they're not saying why they consider that sample an esport a sample of esport players. So they're not including their inclusion criteria. So two, two papers that they say in they were working or researching you know, you know, on esport players, they could they could using different inclusion criteria. That's why it's not I'm not trying to say that uh, this uh, research future research should focus on this on that. I think it's important just to like report it. To for the you know future uh, even future research could 
use that knowledge for virtual methodology. Okay, we, we have a question from the chat that was uh, forwarded to me that also relates to a question of mine. So I know that uh, it's quite important to consider the daytime or the time of day where you measure cortisol. Yes. But I'm honestly no expert in measuring testosterone. So can you please uh, explain what we have to consider when we assess both cortisol and testosterone doing experimental studies? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, even like in traditional sports, they don't have uh, uh, too much uh, evidence, uh, but they're, of course, they're starting increasing. But because of uh, circadian rhythms, uh, it's important to consider the time of day that they are measuring uh, these variables, because, uh, well, the basic theory is that when you wake up, you have like higher levels and uh, uh, by the end of the day, the, your levels, your hormone levels are start to decreasing, you know, by, you know, by getting tired or whatever. So it's, uh, it's, in, it's important to, to report it also. Like, for example, that's one of the things that I didn't do is one of the limitations that of my, um, of my paper uh, is to, to have a, to report it or at least to try to have it, uh, you know, your, your samples in the kind of same time as the day. For testosterone, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little harder because uh, there's much, a lot of variables that can influence also your testosterone levels, even like during the day. So it's, uh, it's, it's been like more consistent on cortisol research, like anticipatory responses has been like uh, reported even like days before uh, an event, an important event, but not so much in testosterone. It's, it's quite a, uh, also a mixed uh, mix kind of uh, results. So I cannot help you much in that, but for sure uh, reporting the time of the day I think in this specific topic, not just physiological, but hormonal responses, I, I think it's, it's important to include as well. Thank you. I have one follow-up question. So is Stefan, um, can you say what period of time it takes for cortisol to have changes in the level of testosterone? No, just testosterone, not cortisol. Oh, uh, testosterone? Uh, it's um, basically more of the um, research are taking um, three, I mean, three, four, four to five moments to, uh, to, to take in samples. Uh, the first one is uh, on, on a rest day. The second one is uh, the moment you wake up. Uh, the third one is uh, one hour to half an hour before you compete. The fourth one is five minutes or at, as close as possible uh, to, um, to compete. And the last one is after you compete. Usually most of the research is taking, uh, I think it's because of, you know, of uh, practicality. Uh, 30 minutes af at least 30 minutes after uh, they compete because in some sports it's harder to like to, to take samples like the, the immediate moments they they just stop playing but i think i mean i i like the knowledge that if if you can take the exact moments you 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 finish i mean you know if you win or lose you will find a different change, you know, in, in your hormone levels. I think that's another factor, you know, that, that half an hour, it's a good enough time to, to find those uh, yeah, levels difference on, on, their, on their bodies. Uh, but more or less, it's, I mean, if we, if we have to design a, a, as complete as possible, a study on hormonal levels, these five moments should be included. 
uh, and of course like the more samples you take i mean the more expensive there the your your study will be and the more complicated to convince your players to you know to take those samples will be as well so it's kind of like uh, uh like isma was was uh, was referring to the the more closest to the real competition you are the less room to you know to the the less moments or the less room you have the less control you have so it's a, if with the ideal research we will will i mean if you ask me what would the ideal research i will include these five moments i don't know if i uh, answer your question sorry i think i debate a little bit thank you for your for your answer i was just I was more referring to the not the me measurement points, but uh, the time it takes cortisol to change in, in levels. So how long it takes to react and measure uh, increase in cortisol levels. So if it takes okay, ten from, minutes from, or from, from okay from I mean if the moments they they encounter a situation you say like they have a cool affect their cortisol. Okay, that's that actually I don't really sure if they have like a specific window to wait, you know, uh, like the latency to, to actually find out. But uh, I, my guess is because they were measuring, uh, you know, the post games, uh, the post games after half an hour, I guess like at least is you need half an hour to, to find those, uh, those difference. Thank you. Okay, Stefan. Uh, yeah, hello, and thank you for your presentation, Guillermo. Um, I don't know, maybe I understood something horribly wrong, or like I was just suspicious. Uh, when you ran uh, through the um, definition of esports, the three parts, you have been mm -hmm. talking about a kind of factor that's like randomness or pay to win. And I was questioning myself, what, uh, what value do you see in like draft picks, blind picks and blind buns and stuff like that? Because on the one hand, it's really a part of the game. And there are like people who really work a lot, like for, for League of Legends, there are so many data. And um, for other, other things as well, there are teams that um, sign analysts. And mm -hmm. yeah, like, um, is, is it, uh, can we call that randomness? And is it, is it, is it uh, does it have a huge value for, for the definition kind of? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I think like I, I passed that uh, very quickly. Uh, I was referring that the third factor that I consider important uh, is the factor of the skill. That if if we are studying an esports, uh, could uh, include a, a game of skill in the way that, for example, in most definition, I could like put for example and um, you know electronic betting into you know into the same definition like playing roulettes on the internet or something like that that's why I, I think it's it's important to include that that some part of the skill I don't say that they have to be fully a game of skill because even like traditional sports has the like big portions of randomness or chance you know uh, but again, like most of the time, it's also affected by skills. In other words, the more skills players or teams should be win more most of the times. So uh, I think like uh, a lot of video games have the share of randomness or have the share of chance, but uh, also have a big, big factor that is, is a skill, of course. And because of that, we could we can research and all as a psychologist, we can work on that part. Uh, because it was if it's a game just to so just a game by chance, uh, its skill wouldn't matter and we wouldn't have room to to work with, you know. But I, I don't think, and I'm sorry if I being misunderstood that uh, you know esports should be a hundred percent game of skills. Like even traditional sports has a big portion of chance, and uh, that part, like you said, of uh, big advance, I think like it's it's a, it's a part of of the strategy, 
uh, uh, and a big part of a uh, big difference from you know uh, regular or friendly games. So I think like it's uh, um, I, I don't know where to to put it uh, because I guess like it is is because it's a big part of strategy knowledge. I put it in in skill in the way that knowing, for example, in chess, that is not a game of randomness, it's just uh, it's, it's a game of skill, knowing, you know, your 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 openings or, or studying, you know, some games, it could be increase your knowledge and your how prepared you are for the next game. I guess I, I put it in, in a skill part more than a chance part. Uh, but yes, of course, I, I mean, if, I'm not being answering your question, but uh, that part I think is a key part of 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 esports. I mean, to 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 difference uh, uh, playing esports, for example, in League of Legends, or playing rankings, or playing you know uh, any other any other part of of League of Legends. So I think like it's 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 included for me as a part of the skills. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for answering this question and the question itself. Um, I would just acknowledge what was written in the chat about this topic. Um, mm -hmm. Matthew said that there's a paper by Laborde, which I will put in the video description um, from this, no, from 2017 on heart rate variability and cardiac vagaltone in psychophysiological research and recommendations for conducting research which also describes variables to assess. And there was also um, added information by Isma that the topic of how to manage variables in dynamic environments, such as lab testings and competitive environment, um, can be considered by using the lens model that proposes a perspective of ecological validity um, and representative designs by Egon Brunswick which will also be in the video description. And now we can move on if the question is still there um, from Brian or has it? Uh, I've, I've kind of got to run, but uh, oh, okay. yeah, thanks Guillermo. I, I'm not uh, physiological or health based, but I could understand that presentation. So kudos, but I just had a bit of a, a strange uh, question. So on a Saturday, right? You say testosterone is boosted by uh, winning, right? And I'm playing CSGO at home mm -hmm. and we're going okay i gotta go to the gym you all know it. we're playing games we're thinking we have to do something but we keep playing games would it actually make an impact if i went to the gym following a couple of losses or a couple of wins so i had a couple of close victories in csgo would that testosterone boost mean a better gym workout or a better motivation so anecdotally or even scientifically is that possibly a thing that could so win okay gym time that's that's a great question. It's actually a great uh, a great topic for future research. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I, well, my I, I have two things that come uh, to my mind. The first one is like you you are including the physicality part with you know uh, uh, a less demanding sports like esports, and uh, like uh, we find that. I mean, uh, traditionally, it, testosterone was considered also uh, uh, very, very close also to physicality, to physical aggression, you know, to aggressiveness in a, in a way of, of, of uh, a physical response or, or power, you know, in a physical response. So the more athletic, you know, like the typical alpha males or the big athletes, strong athletes, it's uh, it's it uh, was uh, close and and presented higher levels of testosterone, but late results or late uh, findings uh, are uh, encountering that uh, even in mental games such as uh, chess or in this case League of Legends, or and um, I guess it will be the same in CS:GO, that regardless uh, the physicality part you could find. Uh, players that can present the same level of testosterone that any any physical athletes or any physical sports. So it uh, so answering your question, 
my guess is that that could help not just by the physicality but by the psychological improvement as well because uh, you know the benefits of uh, a physical training or exercise is also stress release it's also like many other benefits that uh, it, it has to to do some some physical exercise and uh, also all uh, although i didn't talk about it but uh, uh, in physiological research uh, that's why i i, I was talking about psychophysiological research because the mental part of physiological research it shouldn't be excluded in the way that um, also a close, I mean, in not in esports, but in other, other kind of games, a close losses also increase testosterone in a way like if you lose by just a little, uh, your testosterone is also increased not by the results, but by the psychological part. So we're just so close to winning that it was actually motivating by motivating. So, by so the, basically by the after a good game, after you have a good tight match and you're all like pumped up, then it's best to go for a gym. Thanks so much. I've got to run. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Guillermo. Thanks uh, to you, Brian. Okay, then we have a question from Phil. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. I've just got my daughter okay. at the moment, so I'm trying to do two things at once. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts about using other methods as well as sort of cortisol and testosterone measures. So there's other measures that we can use to um, index stress. Is there anything else that you're considering? So, you know, we mentioned heart rate availability or eye tracking to sort of um, triangulate methods in order to better understand stress and its influence on esports performance uh, uh thank you phil for the question yes of course i mean even though i haven't mentioned it because um, again like i was saying my my research is focusing right now in hormonal levels of course that there is a more a more research a, in heart rate variability and even like uh um, areas of the brain that are activated, you know, by playing, you know, there's a, a quite a, a few, few uh, papers about, uh, about the more neurological part of, of, of esports. Uh, if, I don't know if I understand your question correctly, that uh, you're asking me if uh, I, I see that it's, it's, it's good or is, you know, it's have, uh, uh, we should include more physiolo physiological variables that you that you said or yes yeah, so i suppose my question is just the case of you spoke quite a lot about methodologies and i completely agree in terms of you know there's strong methodologies there are weak methodologies and the whole argument with lab-based and ecologically valid research is just you know inherent with any research but i just thought to ask whether or not you believe it's a strength to consider a number of different measures of something like stress rather than just relying on, um, say, you know, uh, saliva samples for cortisol and oh. uh, testosterone. It, it, is there other indices oh. that you could use in conjunction with it so that your conclusions weren't just based on one index? They were maybe spread over a number of different indexes. So you've got a bit of a clearer picture. Uh, uh, got it. Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, it's uh, uh, like also we were discussing about, you know, uh, ecological designs. Uh, it's it's a, a little bit difficult to, you know, to to convince players to to to, uh, you know, to to pay the time to to answer questionnaires or to that's why. Perhaps one of the factors that I choose hormonal measurement is because it's a, a very little invasive because we measure it by taking saliva samples. So it's a little piece of cotton by just 31 30 seconds, one minute, and then like freeze it and, and send it to the lab. But of course, the more variables, I mean, I would will, I will like to, uh, to do... Uh, a research that includes heart rate variability, even like um, many other, like you say, like having a bigger picture 
to you know to actually confirm what we're measuring we're measuring with just one variable if we are measuring more uh, it's like confirmed that that we actually going to the in the right direction uh, but again the more variables that you're measuring the more invasive you are being with your players so sometimes uh, you will uh, at least in my case you will find harder time to convince them to start using or to using properly so uh like again um, everyone or at least myself is starting to researching so i am trying to get in the the best i can so the more variables i can that's why i'm including psychological factors not just hormonal even though i'm reporting here just the physiological ones. I also include in, in my in my paper some psychological uh, variables as well. But if if you're asking me, I would like to measure when they're playing, like giving eye tracking, you know, uh, uh, methods to include uh, to start researching about decision making. Uh, but I mean, actually, we 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 try to do it. That's why I'm I'm saying that I would like to do it. But uh, we try to do it, but the the preparation or the setting to to caliber and to start playing, it was affecting also the you know the the normal the normal way uh, an official game was uh, played. So that's why we we keep, we quit to 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 measure and we just focus on the less invasive uh, variables that we have. It was hormones, but we try to include, for example, uh, eye tracking devices. So the next time perhaps we uh, I include it again will be in a lab setting to the more controlled way that we have. Cool, thanks. Thanks for doing We have seven minutes left. I see no hands raised, so I will go on with a question of, of the chat. Um, we know that sleep is impacting hormonal responses and can you specify how to control or how to measure uh, hormonal responses that are related to sleep and how to inform players that they will be measured and what they can do so in terms of uh, go to yeah. bed at eight and wake up at seven even even when you're not doing a research it's hard to control <laughs> their sleep uh, the sleep hours uh, and have a good, uh, you know, sleep hygiene that you can say. Uh, it's uh, in the, you know, in the actual, uh, you know, practical side of working with uh, not just researching, just by working and helping the players is one of the priorities that first task that, that many uh, performance coaches should address, I think, in my opinion. So doing research uh, and including that, uh, my guess is it will be like way difficult. What, what we did in, for example, the pilot study that I report, uh, we, we actually includes a, um, a sample on the moment they wake up where I, I, I did include that I did measure, but because they were actually waking up in such different times, I have to quit that variable because I couldn't control, you know, the, the, the time they, they wake up. So you should like do or at least have a, a team or a sample that uh, would be the, the, the as close of uh, a, a similar, uh, you know, sleeping time or sleeping habits uh, uh, as possible. Uh, we we didn't we didn't have that we have like a different time frames uh, for them to to wake up so we couldn't like uh, use that that data i mean for for us it was it was not even as useful but uh, answering your question it would be ideal and i guess in the future the closest are we are on making our players more professional and treating them more like athletes, I guess this, this, that will be uh, uh, more possible in the future. Thank you. Okay, now I hand over to M. Hi, hi, Guillermo. 
Uh, th thanks for uh, advertising my work. Uh, it was very interesting oh, yeah. for me uh, <laughs> that you put together those two informations, like our definition of esports and our methodology. I was never thinking about it uh, in this way. Uh, I would say, like, even if I would pick uh, the different definitions, like ISMA or or Yuho Hamari, I think I would make the study pretty much the same. It, it was just basically our interest was in the psychological science and then in esports. That's why we choose this kind of methodology. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I've never thought uh, about uh, connecting the methodology to to the definition, but it's interesting that you you're thinking about it in this way. So it's not a question; it's just a comment and. Many I thanks clarify. for for advertising our work. <laughs> okay, Th thank you for your uh, clarifying. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, actually like uh, like I was saying, uh, my my intention was not to you know to to make like a, just a, a critic, but uh, you know a, an analysis because uh, in in the papers like like yours, uh, I was seeing that. Uh, it was coherent, you know, the, the, the definition, it was coherent with the methodology. You know, the, the wider the definition was, the wider the sample as well, or the wider the methodology. The narrowest the definition, also the narrowest it was the methodology. That was my, my kind of analysis. Uh, I totally understand that. Uh, I mean, if you, if you didn't consider that, I, I totally understand. Like I, I said, I think it's a very valuable research. I, I, I did include myself in my in one of my purpose. But again, it's uh, uh, like I was saying, it was, uh, oh, by the way, in your, like, uh, I have to, to, to praise your research uh, in a step forward because you actually did report the things that I was actually doing. You did report your inclusion criteria, you did report your methodology. So it was actually a good example to, to find that for later researchers, uh, they could follow your same methodology or they could follow a different one. But the thing is that my conclusion was that not to do what I'm saying, is to report it. I think it's important because information, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I think it's, uh, the, the key for helping future research. Okay, we have passed the 90 minute mark. I think it was a great colloquium to cheer myself and you, Guillermo, and the audience. Thank Thanks for, for all your questions. If you have any questions left, feel free to contact Guillermo. Um, I will provide his contact in the description and you can also contact him now. I'll leave the meeting open for another two minutes. Thank you for joining and I'm looking forward to the next meeting. Do you have any last words, Guillermo? Oh, th uh, just uh, saying thank you to you for inviting me. Thank you to all participants of all your questions. Uh, again, like uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm being like uh, uh, pretty excited to, to share this, uh, like I said before, not because I consider myself an expert because I'm sharing my concerns. And I think like if we are like at, at 10 researchers, uh, perhaps we'll be like 10 next papers that will be like even uh, resulting in even more quality work. So uh, thanks and congratulations for the work that you're doing. Great, thank you. Have a nice day.